Abraham Sevron, Then and Now, presented by Jeffrey M. Bradshaw in five parts. Part 5, Mamre. The purpose of this series is to provide a brief introduction to some of the places linked in tradition to the lives of the family of Abraham and Sarah. Many, though not all, of the sites we will visit are in or near the city of Hebron. Although archaeology cannot directly substantiate the scriptural stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it can tell us something about the geography, settlements, and daily life of their contemporaries. Learning more about these places helps us get a more realistic sense of the setting in which the patriarchs lived. It is hoped that this series of presentations will increase exposure to these sites, so rich in biblical history and tradition. Genesis 13, 18 tells us that after separating from his nephew Lot, Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and there built an altar unto the Lord. The Hebrew Bible has Alon of Mamre, which means Oak of Mamre, and not Plain of Mamre, as given in the King James Version. Genesis 14.13 associates the name of the place with one of Abraham's allies in his battle to rescue Lot from the opposing kings, saying that he, quote, dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, a confederate with Abram. Sometimes identified with the tree of life, the tree, which is mentioned also in Genesis 18, was reputed to possess healing properties and powers that ultimately enabled Abraham to rectify the world in his day. Traditions speak of a nearby altar where ritual meals, offerings, and the receipt of divine oracles and revelations could take place. Religious devotions performed in such settings were an approved necessity in nomadic times, but were later condemned when they became the object of distorted forms of worship. Mamre became the site of some of Abraham's most sacred experiences. After his return to Mamre from the rescue of Lot, we read in Genesis 14 that he welcomed Melchizedek, king of Salem and the priest of the Most High God. Joseph Smith explained that Melchizedek was not the king of some country or nation on the earth, but rather that king of Salem was a title referring to his ordination after the order of the Son of God. At Mamre, Abraham received the fullness of the higher priesthood under the hands of Melchizedek. The prophet also explained that afterward, Abraham received his election sure when he demonstrated his willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac. Legend further recounts that Abraham was sitting under the oak of Mamre when he received the visit of three strangers. This icon by Rublev symbolizes the figurative presence of all three members of the Godhead in the three messengers that appeared to Abraham and Sarah to announce the birth of their son Isaac. With reference to accounts of visits of divine messengers that were sent to teach the gospel to Adam and Eve, a BYU professor Alonzo Gaskill observes that, quote, Peter, James, and John, whether appearing to Adam and Eve or serving as the head of the post-resurrection church in the meridian of time, are symbols of something much, something much greater than themselves, namely the Godhead, as are all subsequent first presences. Whether these three brethren, or any set of tripartite messengers, had physical contact with Adam and Eve, or any other Old Testament figure, makes no difference. What is important is what they brought and whom they represented." End of quote. The pre three personages shown here are arranged in a circle, with their hands and their gazes centered on a chalice of wine, a symbol of the voluntary sacrifice of the Son of God. Abraham and Isaac will themselves become figures of the Father and the Son in Isaac's near sacrifice. The Father, represented at left, is dressed differently than the other two. He wears a pale pink cloak with brown and blue-green lights of sober and indefinite hue that covers both shoulders. The Son, depicted in the middle, has the customary colors of a purple chiton, meaning a draped or belted tunic, and a blue coat draped over his left shoulder, the color of the cloak symbolizing incarnation. Behind him grows a tree of life, born of his sacrificial death. The principal color of the Holy Spirit is green, represented in the cloak draped over his right shoulder. Here the color green signifies youth, fullness of powers. This specifically indicates the properties of renewing all things and giving them life. 
The symbolism recalls the promise made in DNC 84 to those who are to be sanctified by the Spirit and to the renewing of their bodies. The sites associated with Biblical Mamre that we will visit in this presentation are a short distance to the north and northwest of Hebron. But before we go to the traditional sites of Mamre, we will make a quick stop in the St. George Church in Madaba, Jordan, about 20 miles down the King's Highway from Amman. The present church was built in 1880. The church is more commonly known as the Church of the Map. Map mosaics from Byzantine era once commonly adorned the floors of many churches and homes in the region. The partially preserved map of Palestine shown here has been dated to the last half of the 6th century and is made up of more than 2 million tiny tiles. Researchers have found great value in the descriptions and depictions of the 157 sites shown on the map. A photo and diagram of Mamre and Hebron are shown here. The fragmentary Greek above says Arbo, meaning the ancient Kiryath Arba, and also the Terebinth and the Oak of Mamre. The buildings at left represent Constantine's Basilica and perhaps an attached monastery. The tree represents Abraham's oak, and the structure at right is the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron itself, after Herod's roofless monument was transformed into a Christian church. Meisterman's 1906 map of the holy places of Hebron, in red, illustrates some of the difficulties in pinpointing ancient locations for Mamre in the vicinity. There are five candidates that have been proposed. One, at least one ancient account says that Abraham's tree was once located within the area now enclosed by the tomb of the patriarchs over the cave of, cave of Machpelah. A more plausible location for the tent, oak, altar, and well of Abraham is on Tel Hebron, the site of ancient Hebron that was the sub subject of the fourth video in this series. Arguing for this site is that five references in Genesis specifically mention that Machpelah, the place of burial for Abraham's family, was located, quote, before Mamre, meaning to the east of Mamre. Tel Hebron is the only one of the candidate sites for Mamre that fits this description. One site that has a claim on the grounds other than tradition is that called Kirbet and Ain Nimra, literally the ruin and spring of the leopard, about a half mile north-northwest of modern Hebron. The word Nimre may be a survival of the ancient Mamre, the name, as often happens, being assimilated by a familiar word. The site is a possible one, but beyond this the name has not much to commend it. 4. A large oak at the site, owned by the Russian Orthodox Church, about three kilometers west-northwest of the modern city, is often shown today as the Terebinth of Abraham. However, the tradition goes back only to the last several centuries. 5. Several Christian writers refer to a great terebinth which once stood in an enclosure some two or three kilometers north of Hebron, near the road to Jerusalem. This is almost certainly the site now known as Beit al-Khalil, or Ramat al-Khalil in Arabic, and Elonei Mamre in Hebrew. Its identity with Mamre is attested since the time of Herod the Great 2,000 years ago. However, archaeologists have determined that such an identification is less probable for earlier periods. In this presentation, we will focus on the last two of these places. The location of the Oak of Sibta, kept by the Russian Orthodox Church and located about one kilometer west of the bypass road, and Ramat el Khalil, located about halfway between Halhul and Hebron, some 500 meters down a turnoff onto road 3507 toward Jericho. The beautiful tree at the Russian site has been venerated since the beginning of the Middle Ages. Its age has been variously estimated from 1,000 to 5,000 years old. The girth of its trunk is about 10 meters. In former times, it grew undisturbed in the middle of a field surrounded by a small rock wall. However, today, it sits behind a nondescript gate. This sign behind the gate reads Eshel, or Tamarisk of Abraham, but consistent with the English wording, it is really an alon, or oak. 
Specifically, it is a Quercus ilex, or an Arabic Sindium. The Church of the Holy Trinity Monastery, or Moshkabia, was built in 1871. The name of the monastery recalls the famous icon of the Holy Trinity that corresponds symbolically to Abraham's three visitors. The site was the subject of serious contention among the Palestinian authorities and two different factions of the Russian Orthodox Church from 1997 to 2007. The home of the Palestinian caretaker is at left once one enters the site proper. This postcard from 1960 shows the caretaker at left against the fence and his two sons near the front center. Behind the tree is a peaceful rural hillside. Forty-eight years later, in 2008, the son shown at left in the postcard, Anwar Zabla, had become the caretaker. Six years later, in 2014, Anwar's beard had turned white and his voice had grown. The hillside behind the tree is full of buildings. Anwar holds the postcard showing himself as a boy. Not only the caretaker's family, but also the tree itself has aged. In 1865, it was still flourishing. The site was acquired in 1868 by Archimandrite Antonin Kapushin for the Church of Russia and the nearby monastery of the Holy Trinity was founded. As the only functioning Christian site in the Hebron area, it attracted Russian pilgrims and other Christians. However, by the end of the 19th century, the tree was in serious decline. A 1912 visitor, Israel Abrahams, wrote of the tree as follows, quote, A few years ago it was a fresh, vigorous giant, but now it is quite decayed. The ruin began in 1853 when a large branch was broken off by the weight of the snow. Twelve years ago, the Russian Archimandrite of Jerusalem purchased the land in which the tree stands, and naturally he took much care of the relic. In fact, he took too much care, for some people think that the low wall which the Russians erected as a safeguard round the oak has been the cause of the rapid decay that has since set in. Year by year, the branches have dropped off. The snow and the lightning have had their victims. It is said that only two or three years ago one branch toward the east was still living, but when I saw it, the trunk was bare and barkless, full of little warm holes, and quite without a spark of vitality." End of quote. This is a photo of the tree taken in 2008. While the decline of the tree is tragic from a botanical point of view, Others view it as a positive sign that portends the end of times and the glorious second coming of Christ. A long-standing tradition is that the Oak of Abraham had to die before the Antichrist could appear in fulfillment of prophecy. The main trunk has been dead since 1996. However, in 1998, a root sprout appeared. Today, Anwar Zabla tends Abraham's daughters, two small oaks growing nearby the progeny of the original tree. This final site we will visit is called Elone Mamre, or Oaks of Mamre in Hebrew, or Ramat El Khalil in Arabic. Talmudic sources refer to the site as Bet Ilanim, or Botna, both names referring to the tree. The site is located about 400 meters from the Glassworks Junction. The old entrance to Hebron and Kiryat Arba along what used to be the main Jerusalem-Hebron highway. Skilled blowers here still work wonders with liquid glass, handling it deftly as if it were mere taffy. This is a job that you would not like to be doing in the middle of a hot Hebron summer. This scenic view of Ramat al-Khalil from earlier times looks back and up from the plains toward the tomb of the patriarchs near the center and Tel Hebron, ancient Hebron, at right. This image shows Leon Rittmeyer's conjectural reconstruction of, of an enclosure for the site built by Herod the Great 2,000 years ago. A well and perhaps a tree stood at right, and an altar is thought to have been situated near the center of the compound. The wall encompassed an area of 150 feet by 200 feet. The lack of coins dating to between 70 and 135 AD 
confirms that the monument was destroyed during the Jew Jewish war with the Romans and rebuilt 65 late years later by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Along with Gaza and Akko, Mamre was one of the three most important public markets in Palestine and was dedicated to pagan worship. After the crushing of the Bar Kokhba revolt, Jews were slowed, sold here as slaves. The similarity of the stonework to the temple in Jerusalem and the tomb of the patriarchs has led archaeologists to conclude that Herod the Great was responsible for all three of these structures. A difference here is the lack of the distinctive margins cut along the edges of each stone. Also unlike the two other buildings, the stones get larger as they go higher, increasing the illusion of height, despite the low height of the walls. According to some scholars, aspects of the monumental style of the stonework can be traced as far back as Solomon's temple. Deploring the pagan revelry at this site, the Roman Emperor Constantine, who had converted to Christianity, built a church here at about 330 AD. The walls of the excavated church can be seen in the top third of the image. At the bottom right, the round opening, what has been called Abraham's Well, can be seen. According to one historian, quote, the Constantine Basilica is the earliest of its kind in Palestine. It is of the broad house type and measures 50 feet by 60 feet. In the atrium to the west of the church stood the Oak of Abraham and near it was the well. The church was probably destroyed by the Persians in AD 614, but it was rebuilt immediately. The earliest of the 1300, uh, 1331 coins found in the well date from the Maccabean period the latest from Crusader times. Three professional excavations of the site have taken place. The first, from 1926 to 1928 by Andreas Mader, the German scholar, was published in English in 1957. In 1984 through 1986, Itzhak Magen revisited, revised some of Mader's conclusions. Magen believed that King Herod built this site for the Edomites, who had inhabited the area since the destruction of the first temple, and that here they held regular markets and annual festivals according to the practices of pagan worship that seemed to have continued uninterrupted beyond the time of Constantine, despite his efforts to stop them. Current excavations are being directed by Vincent Michel of the University of Poitiers, France, shown here with his team. Michel's aim is to get a more accurate view of what happened when at the site. Here's a panoramic view of the Ramat al-Khalil from 2014. Tall buildings have sprouted up on all sides of its once rural setting. This photo looks toward the site of Constantine's Basilica. And this photo looks toward the southeast corner of the structure. The site of Abraham's well, near where a large tree was once located, is circled in red. The well still flows. Near the time of when the current archaeological team began their work in 2016, an enclosure was built over the well. Archaeologist Vlastimil Drubal is shown at left. We close this visit with Hugh Nibley's moving recounting of the story of the three messengers to Abraham. Like so many other events in the life of this extraordinary patriarch, the blessing of a child through Sarah was extremely unusual and completely unanticipated. A Jewish sage observed, quote, In the literal sense, the Torah mentions that Abraham was sitting by the door of his tent to inform us that Abraham had not expected to receive a prophetic vision. When they appeared, he had neither fallen on his face to make himself fit to receive prophecy, nor was he engaged in prayer. It came upon him unexpectedly as a sign of favor. Remember, we're told that Abraham was tested to the last extreme, to the ultimate extremity, as we're told in the Doctrine and Covenants. Unless you're willing to give everything, you cannot claim eternal life. It's not to be cheaply bought. These are the great blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and must be brought. They must be willing even to give life itself and so forth. That's just a story told in the Midrash. It begins with Abraham sitting in the door of his tent in the plain of Mamre in the heat of the day. 
But this was a hot day, you see, is what inspired the story probably. It was a hot day, it says. It was a day like the breath of Gehinnom, like the breath of hell was coming out. And we, you can see the kind of country it was and is when this, this is so, the heat and the dust and the sand, the utter desolation. And he was worried, of course, because he, he says some poor stranger might be lost out there. Someone might have lost his way and uh, be perishing because he's not going to last high on this. So he sent his faithful servant, Eliezer, out to look everywhere. He sent him out in all directions. He came back. No, I can't find anyone anywhere. He was still worried. He says there might be someone out there. And you, you have these feelings. So he, he went out himself, though he was very sick at the time. He was sick and ailing and old, and he went out and into that hell. And he looked and searched, but he found no one. And at the end of the day, he came back exhausted toward his tent. As he approached the tent, the three strangers were standing there. It was the Lord and the two with him, because the Lord goes with us. He counts us, so to speak. He throws himself down in his face. And then it is that he promises him Isaac <laughs> as a reward for what he had done. The Suprema. It's a very moving story. He'd gone out to look for his fellow man and out in that dusty hell, you see, all along. Eliezer couldn't find him. He said, I think I can find something. Well, he found something. He found the answer to the thing he'd prayed for all his life, his son Isaac.